So, good afternoon. Of course, this conference uh, is also about networking, as Dan was reminding me. So, it's always difficult to stop the good networking around the lunch table. But I think we have also interesting presentations and the possibility to continue with a very useful session with questions and answers also for this session two. This morning we had uh, very interesting return of experiences and a glimpse of what is happening in the real world. And I think this is exactly where we wanted to start and to set the scene as our director said for this conference. Uh, this second session will focus more on uh, what is happening maybe in Valenciennes or Lille or Brussels or, or I can say remotely from the different implementations regarding the maintenance of the specification of this harmonized system, the preparation for the future, what will happen with the need to improve specification, include new functionalities and how the agency is preparing for its new important role for the photography package. Uh, I think indeed the photography package is the single most important game changer that we are seeing in the rail environment uh, since uh, a number of years. Um, we will have a set of uh, 13 different speakers. We will have one long session that will go for two hours and 45 minutes, again a challenge. But at the end, we will have the right to have the cocktail. So additional networking, additional celebration. So please bear with me. Take your seat. Um, I will just give as an introduction one small element uh, for reflection on the recent opinion of the agency on the error correction for ETMS uh, specifications. This is part of our institutional role as system authority to take care of the harmonized specifications. We have heard this morning specifications are not perfect, and I think this is clear. We need not only the specification, we need competent suppliers, we need uh, competent laboratories or test facilities, we need the possibility to engineer correctly trackside and onboard system. And of course, the specifications uh, will always be subject to improvements. We will discover errors. It is a complex system. This is why in the uh, regulation for the CCS TSR, we have an article, Article 10, that requires that the agency assess the situation with the errors that can prevent the normal service of the system. And the agency should transparently publish the solutions and assess the impact of those errors. This is what we have done together with the sector in the different working groups. This has resulted in an opinion that we have published, sent to the Commission and published on, on our website. We have identified uh, 22 errors that can prevent uh, the system running normal service. And for the first time, this technical opinion is not immediately suggesting that we should modify, update the specification. On the contrary, what we are saying is that we want to keep uh, compatibility uh, with the already existing investments, trackside and on board. What we propose in the opinion, in fact, is that there is this work which is building on the experience that has been presented this morning uh, by the users group together with uh, NECO concerning this uh, baseline compatibility analysis. I think this is the way forward. We should not dream to do a complete update of all the software in all the trains running everywhere in Europe. What we propose in the opinion, in fact, is case by case, check, and this is a work for the infrastructure manager with the help of their suppliers, what is the situation in the different lines. Because in most of the cases, as we have seen in the uh, graph presented by, by INECO this morning, the situation is not so bad. So in most cases, what we have identified are theoretical issues or problems that can indeed, that must be uh, analyzed. But I think this is the way forward that uh, we are trying to promote. This is an integral part of the, the action plan that uh, tomorrow the Commission, that the Director General will present. 
this is subject also, uh, this is one important topic for the discussion in the stakeholder platform this afternoon. So without any further ado, let me do my job as just the moderator of this um, panel. Uh, we will have a first uh, session trying to set the scene for the future task of the agency in terms of vehicle authorization, which is what the photo of package is really about. It's not about subsistence in the vehicle. It's the vehicle that is getting the authorization, and EATMF is a part of the vehicle. And then we will move to the corresponding part, which is the truck side, not the authorization. I mean, the agency will not entrust with authorization of uh, the, the truck side subsistence, but with the approval, which would be a prerequisite for the MSA to give an authorization. And to the important topic of the route compatibility, because in the end we have to understand clearly what is what we need to check at the time of authorization and what is left later uh, for check at the time of the, the route compatibility. And of course, since we are in this journey, as some of the colleagues were saying this morning in the presentation, we are not yet in a fully TSI compliant world. So national technical rules, as long as they are fully published and uh, transparently uh, communicated, are part of the uh, reference that needs to be checked uh, at the time of authorization. This will be the, the first set of presentations that we'll have. I will ask then first uh, my colleague Jean-Francois Demontier from the safety unit to take the floor. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So I will give you a uh, very high level uh, information about vehicle authorization and uh, try to give uh, some tracks for thinking about the impact on uh, the ERTMS onboard equipment and how it will be uh, dealt with during the vehicle authorization under the fourth freeway package. So we have essentially three major texts. Okay. We have the regulation 2016-796, uh, in which uh, the Article 2 says that uh, the agency will become the union authority responsible for issuing authorization for placing on the market of railway vehicles and railway vehicle types. That's a, a very key formation. So the agency will, will take a major role uh, in the vehicle authorization and vehicle type authorization. We have then the Directive 2016-797, which is a recast of the interop uh, directive. And uh, more specifically, we have Article 21 and 24 uh, describing the process uh, at a global level for authorizing vehicle and vehicle types. I will point out uh, in these two articles that the applicant for a vehicle authorization has the choice to apply to the agency or the NSA when the area of use is limited to one member state. Okay, so there, when there is an area of use for one member state, the applicant can choose between the agency and the NSA. Then, for all the other cases, it will be uh, the agency. The third major document that we have is the Implementing Act on Vehicle Authorization that is currently uh, discussed uh, at risk and uh, for which we expect a vote uh, this week. So, this document goes into much more detail about the different stages that we have in the vehicle authorization. Okay. So we have a granularity in those three documents, uh, high level the regulation, then lower level the directive, and then the details in the implementing act. There will be other documents describing uh, that, like the application guide. Okay? I will point out in uh, the different stages uh, some uh, aspects that are important for ERTMS equipment. It is the pre-engagement. So we will have the, we offer an optional uh, we'll, we will offer the possibility to pre-engage. So discuss before the vehicle authorization about the content of uh, the authorization. Okay, there will be the one-stop shop. So there will be a central point to apply for vehicle authorization. So all application, whatever uh, domestic, meaning one member state or multinational uh, ones, they will go through one-stop shop. So one single entry point where we collect the information. 
uh, about the processing, so we have distinguished a completeness check, the first phase of one month to examine if the file is complete, and then four months for the assessment. If the agency is the authorizing entity, the, uh, the agency will continue to work with the NSAs for the national parts. So there will be a coordination needed at that level. Then, uh, I give you here some ideas about the effect that the fourth railway package vehicle authorization could have on ERTMS onboard equipment. In fact, as uh, we have the pre-engagement, the pre-engagement uh, starts very early in the process of vehicle authorization, and so there is the possibility to uh, request more information or to try to discuss very early in a vehicle authorization about the ERTMS onboard equipment. Okay, it's a discussion, the, the agency or the NSA will emit an opinion, okay? But it is very interesting to know that this can uh, be very early in the vehicle authorization process. The second aspect is that uh, we can centralize the things to the agency level. If the applicant uh, requires so to the agency, so the agency will be the authorizing entity, uh, only the agency will uh, supervise the resolution of the question, okay? So it's interesting that we can have only one authority for multiple member states. Okay? One voice can be uh, the result of this uh, approach. Then, normally, we will also have one unique process. So all the NSAs and the agency should apply the same process. Then, uh, finally, as we have all the information in the OSS, uh, we can retrieve in the OSS, all the decisions about vehicle authorization, meaning we can retrieve all the restrictions and so on, that are linked to ERTMS onboard equipment. So there, we can build a kind of database that could be reused to examine where to improve the ERTMS uh, specifications. So that is a possibility. It's a tool that, with time, we could uh, start to use to improve uh, the specification of ERTMS. Voila. Uh, for the next presentation, and uh, I think we will collect questions uh, after. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. I'm Maria Bueno. I work uh, at the, in the ERTMS unit at the agency, and I'm here today to talk about the ERTMS trackside approval. That is uh, one of the new tasks of the four-way package. This uh, ERTMS trackset approval is not only a new task uh, for the agency, it's a completely new task that didn't exist before. So uh, for the authorization of the fixed installations remains uh, responsibility of the NSAs but uh, the application file of an authorization should include an ERTMS track set approval given by the agency. So as you see, now we have a new, totally new task that has to be done before authorization. The legal base of uh, this track site approval is uh, the new interpretive directive that was published in May 2016, uh, in May next year, and the uh, agency regulation. This uh, legal basis, uh, these articles, uh, doesn't really describe the process or does not precisely detail the application file. And for that, uh, the agency uh, developed a document called Practical Arrangements, where the process was better described and was the base for an easy recommendation draft from the European Commission. So in this draft, uh, you can better uh, find uh, the documentation that should be uh, used for decision on approval. Uh, this uh, draft recommendation, even if the agency has no uh, legal obligation to, to detail the process that was presented in a workshop last year in November, and that was discussed, we, uh, the agency received many, many comments and there was a second version considering those comments presented in February. 
and after February, uh, the agency started with the learning cases that uh, we think is, uh, is fundamental to, to test and to improve uh, the new process. The, the main objective is to approve, uh, I mean, to adopt the, in the next weeks in January, uh, the EC recommendation. Here, uh, of course, we don't have time. It's just to tell you that uh, the documentation that is requested for an application file for approval is the detail in the EC recommendation. And most of the documents are generic things uh, describing the project or documents that already exist in the EU legislation. But we added two of them, like the lease on functions and the ISU log. These two documents are totally new and specific for the approval. And the intention is that the list on functions can help on identify if the issues apply for these uh, tracks that approval or not. And the issues are collected from experience in the projects. These issues are potential risks of interoperability that uh, was, were discovered in, in previous experiences with ERTMS in, in real projects. Uh, this slide, uh, well, it's very complex to explain it here today, that was presented in the workshop uh, in November, uh, not in February this year, and it's only to stress that the aim of the track set approval is to check that the technical solution is interoperable. So what it is important is to get this uh, description, the technical description of the uh, track site solution. So at least this information of the technical description is necessary. And depending on the tender process and depending on the maturity of the country in year SMS, and uh, maybe when we start uh, the process, it is possible that some approval is provided after the tendering process. And uh, now I here want to say that uh, we are now in the, the current situation is that we are running learning cases. Uh, hopefully we had some volunteers and uh, we could uh, immediately after the workshop in February uh, start to learn some memorandum of understandings with Norway, Sweden and uh, Spain and we are collaborating also with Belgium and we are building this issue log and uh, testing it and of course the, the intention is to improve the, the, new, the new era task. So uh, It is very important for us to know uh, what are the coming projects. Uh, now we are finalizing the learning cases. We will do a report. We will publish a better application guide at the end of the year. But we still need to go on with learning cases the next year. And uh, it's very important for the agency that we have uh, cases that are the coming approval. And we don't have information of uh, what are the uh, coming projects in 2019 or 2020 that will launch ERTMS or I mean ETCS or DSMR tenders. So as today is very short time, I want to tell you that I'm here today and tomorrow and we have uh, breaks. Uh, you can find me easily on the, on the deployment management table that we have uh, put in the lunch area. And there you can ask me more questions because today we have a tight schedule. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you Maria. And uh, now that uh, the authorization for the vehicle and the authorization for the tra track site is done, what needs to be done? What, what is missing? Maybe one of the nuances of this new uh, directive uh, in the photo package is that now the vehicles are authorized for placing on the market. It's no longer an authorization to place into service. So there is one important step that Pedro Mestre, our colleague from the agency, will demonstrate now. Thank you. Thank you, Pio. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pedro Mestre. Uh, I'm from the interoperability unit of the agency, hauling stock sector. Uh, and my presentation will follow the sequence of the one started by Jean-Francois. And I will enter more into detail of the network and mostly good compatibility. So be before we continue on those concepts, um, we need to, to, to have an overview, a remind 
of the definitions which are in our legal basis, meaning the vehicle is a railway vehicle suitable for circulation on wheels on railway lines, with or without traction, composed of one or more subsystems, normally hauling stock and CCS subsystem. Um, root uh, means the particular section or sections of line uh, and the geographical way to be taken for, from a starting point to a point of destination. So networks are composed of subsystems, uh, normally fixed um, installation subsystems like Infen and CCS track side, uh, and it is technically described by mean of parameters recorded in the register of infrastructure. Area of use of a vehicle can cover more than one member state or one or more networks is specified by the applicant in its application and it is mentioned in the authorization delivery. Should be mentioned um, making reference to the member states and the values of the parameters related to the technical compatibility between the vehicle and the area of use. Here I give two examples like voltage, track gauge. Uh, should not be mentioned with a list of networks. Uh, we have today in some cases in some uh, member states this approach, but uh, it should not at the European level be faced on the same way. It is verified at the authorization stage according to the Article 21.3 of the Interop Directive. So, uh, making a, an overview of what we had and what we have today, um, this concept is not new. Uh, it was already covered in the first Railway Directives and of ETSI. Um, it was also identified as one of the proposals for the Register of Infrastructure. However, the fourth Railway Package uh, brings a clear distinction, as the PO already mentioned, between authorization and use of a vehicle. Uh, today the vehicle authorization is for placing on the market instead of placing in service. Um, and this figure was better clarified with the Fort Railway package, and I mean the figure of checks uh, before use of the authorized vehicles on the intended route. Um, today it is also, let's say, more clarified in the, in the directive the responsibility of the different stakeholders. The authorization is granted, as explained already, by Jean-Francois, by NSA or agency, to the vehicles at the request of applicants, but the railway undertakings are responsible to perform the compatibility check between vehicles, those vehicles already authorized, um, and also the trains, obviously, and the routes in which they intend to use the vehicles. So this gives an overview of the, um, what is intended, what is brought by the Port Railway package, and I am focusing more uh, in the technical compatibility subject. So the technical compatibility of the vehicle with a network in the area of use is accessed during the authorization process. The root compatibility is after the authorization and before the first two use of the, of the vehicle in an intended route. And this is literally the wording of the, um, of the directive. On the basis of the register of infrastructure, the relevant TSIs or any information to be provided by the infrastructure manager free of charge and within a reasonable period of time where such a register does not exist or it is incomplete. So what we are doing today is the agency is preparing the list of relevant data for the proposal of compatibility checks. And we are taking into account the interface parameters that today are defined in the TSIs, the relevant national rules and national practices, how the infrastructure is today described in the HIMF, uh, and the range of conditions and use defined according to TSIs and to be recording in the technical file attached to the EC declaration of verification. Uh, the next steps are uh, agreement within the agency's working parties on the parameters relevant for root compatibility slash area of use in the lock and pass VAC and CCS TSIs, complement the OPE TSI for compatibility checks procedure 
and complement relevant registers if required. So we are revising the registers, mainly the register of infrastructure. Obviously, each time we make uh, such work, we update the application guides. So this is the last slide, and um, it gives you an overview of what we are doing, and especially the deadlines we have, uh, meaning that the projects of revision of TSI lock and pass, CCS and Wagon, impacts the OPTSI, and why? Um, technical compatibility uh, is related, directly related with interfaces between the subsystems. Um, the process, as it is mentioned in the directive today, um, still, obviously, uh, involves the relationship between the Halloway undertakings and the infra managers. Uh, even if the, the information regarding the infrastructures is in the HINF, is on the basis of the declarations of the infra manager. So this relationship today is dealt with by, or it is regulated by OPTSI. This is why the procedure itself will be uh, supplied to be included in the TSIOP. So the structural working part is dealing with the structural TSI, CCS, lock and pass and wagon. Uh, they will define the procedures, they will mention the parameters and they will give this output as the input to update the TSIOP. Please pay attention, this is my last comment, um, the really tighten deadlines that we have. So we need to have stable drafts of this in order to, to be able to, to, to adopt the Fork Railway package at the end of June of the next year, meaning this six, seven months. So thank you very much. Uh, as Maria, I will be here today. Uh, if we don't have time for uh, further questions here, please come to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, Borinel Melinte, from the agency, a colleague, that will discuss and present the situation and the progress with the national technical rules. Hello, good afternoon. Fine. Thank you. So, uh, regarding the national rules, as uh, Pio was saying earlier, we have we still have need of nation rules. Of course, we need to have them uh, available and uh, reliable and uh, not more than needed. So the basic needs, I quoted the, the, the definition from the directive and I will focus on the basic needs for nation rules, which are the applicants needs to have access to those rules, of course. The member state has to have a place to publish and notify the applicable nation rules. According to the new framework, we have to go in deep and examine the nation, uh, the notified nation rules, and the, the agency, the Commission, has to validate those. What is the current situation? Uh, it's not very, uh, very obvious, but that's the f the situation. We have three systems, which uh, are having functionality which sometimes overlap. So we have uh, Notifit, which is administered by the Commission, which is uh, dealing with draft safety rules, adopted safety rules, and adopted technical rules, uh, which I highlighted includes the rules for nation rules for <coughs> CCS track sites. Uh, CCS track site. In the respect for rules for vehicle authorization, we have the reference document database, which is administered by the agency where we have the nation technical rules, which includes the rules for CCS on board, and possible acceptable national means of compliance if the member states decide to provide those things, which are the so-called not mandatory nation rules. And we have also the classification of rules, um, which can serve for um, eliminating for cross-acceptance uh, activity. In terms of draft technical rules, uh, normally TRIS database has to be used, even though we, it's uh, not always happening this way. In the, um, in the presentation, we have some more details related to the three databases, which I will not stop now into those. So I will try to see, to show you now how we will change from the current situation 
So we will move from one database to a single database. Obviously, the name is self-defining, self it's single rules database. It will provide the access to the nation rules on the public side, and of course, it will be a platform for the nation rules management, including publication, notification, and examination from the point of view of the uh, agency and the commission. This will eliminate the necessity of notifit and RDDs, so those systems most probably will fade away. Um, it will not take out of use trees, but it will eliminate the need of using trees for draft technical rules. The system is forecasted to be in use by June 2019. Uh, it's a very sportive plan we have, but that's the way it is. Um, and this includes also the migration of the relevant data from the other systems uh, by that date. Um, in the process of preparation of the specifications and building the new systems, of course, we will try to take on board the good lessons, good learn lessons from the um, um, development and maintenance of the RDD and Notifit and try to avoid uh, the mistake made there or the bad choices. Um, as we know in most of the cases, uh, a database without the content is not too much, so we need also to prepare uh, the content, the rules. So I'll focus a little bit on the next slide, uh, more in detail to the part of cleaning up of rules uh, for the CCS on board, which is for the vehicle part. So in RDD, as I have said, is maintained by the agency. We provide also support for the member state to populate those, uh, this system with nation rules. We want to take to make very clear that the content published in RDD is in full responsibility of the member state. Um, of course, the RDD at the end should contain all the necessary rules for vehicle authorization, which of course uh, includes the CCS on board part. Um, in the assessment we are doing in the, in the part of the cleaning up of rules, we are focusing with the first priority on the rules which are to be used in addition to the latest TSI reports. We don't disregard the rest of the nation rules, but that will be treated in a, with a second prior, in a second prior, in a second stage. Um, the nation rules in RDD are structured based on the list of parameters. The migration to the list, the list of parameters was, uh, it's, all, it's on the way, it is almost finished. Normally by the end of the year, we should have uh, migrated all the rules for all the member states in this list and most of the cleaning up should have been finished by that time. Um, the rules for CCS on board are to be found associated with parameters in chapter 12. And um, one element which was uh, discussed with our colleagues in the TMS unit is that there is a need apparently to have a clear attach, uh, a clear, uh, to, to specify clearly the, um, for which baseline uh, rule for CCS on board it is, um, it is needed. So for the moment it is, you have to, this information should be provided in the text of the rule. We will have we already have an initiative to try to implement uh, a feature in RDD that a special field will be created for this. Um, a little bit of practical, uh, I will skip it quickly. It's not so complicated, but in most of the cases we get these questions, how I get rules from RDDs. Maybe it's not very obvious. So just there are two basic uses scenario. Either you use the rules offline, so you'll get the details on this slide to get your way into the system and extract the report containing the rule, or you just can consult the rules so directly in RDD on using the scenario two. In case you need any questions, there is a feedback uh, a menu uh, item in the system that you can always ask further questions. Uh, a little bit more related to the national technical rules for ETCS. So um, 
for this one, uh, I will have uh, the support of Hans in a few minutes. In a few seconds after, <laughs> I will pass by half of the slide, more or less. So uh, the nation rules are captured and assessed during the cleaning up of uh, rules in the dialogue with the member states. Uh, in some cases, this content is not always available immediately in the system, but is available on the, um, in this report, uh, pending to be uh, uploaded, imported in the system, and then uh, published. Uh, some of the rules we had, they was identified by my colleagues in the ET, in, for the ETCS. They might not have their place in, in RDD, as the RDD scope is quite limited. is limited only to vehicle authorization rules. So if there are some things like uh, operation rules or something, or some other aspects we treat it, it will be, we we'll have to find a suitable place for those rules. It will not be just thrown away. Um, the rules for testing are identified but not considered in the assessment discussion. Uh, they will be on hold until the, the outcome of the test ERTMS working group. Um, in case rules are identified as addressing enhancements or possible error correction, error will agree with the rule on a temporary basis based on the outcome of the change request uh, will be treated. And. Uh, now, Hans will continue with more details and the uh, detail uh, status of the cleaning up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Not too much because we're running out of time. <laughs> okay, I, I want to come back to this uh, website. Here is where we actually published the rules for ETCS and GSMR. They are not yet in the RDD. Uh, these are the rules which we are discussing with the member states. Um, they include, as already mentioned by Florinel, a lot of additional things which are not necessary to have in case you are a TSI compliant vehicle. Therefore, we have invented uh, categories for the rules. And as Florinel said, not all of them will make it uh, at the end to the RDD, but they will be somewhere else. Uh, the good news is that, what I already said, not all the rules are really impacting an ETCS vehicle or impacting especially a baseline 3 vehicle. Uh, one example is here. Netherlands has um, 10 rules, which we have discussed. None of this rule is applicable for ETCS baseline, two release, uh, baseline 3 release 2 on board, uh, except that there is an issue for testing, that's clear. Um, there are additional requirements concerning radio shunting, but not all vehicles are doing radio shunting. And they are asking for two communication sessions, which more or less is fulfilled by baseline one of the GSMR uh, specifications. This is an overview where we actually are. Um, for the green one, we have to say we have finalized the discussion with the member states. For some of them, we have still a problem because there are rules we do not agree. I will come to, back to this later. And for the, I don't know which color it is, uh, the, the, the light green, uh, further discussions are needed or discussions have already taken place last week or will be take place within the next two months. Okay, now we have a blue sky. I don't know why. Normally there should be uh, a map. Sorry? Yes, this is, this is the target, the clean rules. <laughs> okay, can we come back to the map? So the, there is a map which gives you a, a certain overview um, on, on the member states which, uh, which we have finished. Uh, it seems it doesn't work, no problem. Um, we have some member states, which I already mentioned, where there are rules we do not agree. I give you one example. In Austria, they require cold movement detector from 2021 on uh, for all onboards when they are first authorized. This is clearly, as it is not in the TSI, an export constraint, and we as agency cannot agree on this. It's depends on the member state. The member state still can notify the rule. The rule will uh, check by the commission and maybe the commission will agree. 
but it's not the agency uh, from who will agree on, on such rules. We have other rules like in um, Spain, no, in, in, sorry, in Belgium, uh, where they require a link between GSMR and the driver safety device. Oh, we are back. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, this this is again. Uh, let me see a more uh, yes general overview. The, the green part is agreed. The other green part we are still in discussion, and uh, we have some member states, as already mentioned. Um, no, I have not. Belgium they require that the driver safety device alarm will be should be transmitted via GSMR. It's an option, but. In case it's mandatory, it's an export constraint. Uh, another example is, I noted this already, Austria with the cold movement detector for 2021, or Germany, uh, who require baseline one GSMR also for reauthorization of already authorized vehicles, um, which is, I would say, again, an export constraint. We have several member states, mainly the early implementer, who have additional rules based on the past experience, uh, which may lead to the fact that when we have finished the discussion, we may not agree on it. And that's it concerning the rules. Uh, we will update our document on our website next week after the conference. I have some time to work on it because we have to feed in the discussions we had in the last weeks. Thank you. Thanks to all the colleagues. I think that we have seen how we are preparing for the future in terms of the portable package, organization, responsibilities, and uh, the protocols and uh, the way we will work. Now, the next uh, group of presentations will be how we prepare for the future in terms of technical standards and, and systems. In particular, we will see how the definition of the next uh, generation of the communication system for railways is being defined. We will have four speakers. I will ask first uh, my colleague here, Spans, to join us and start this session. Thank you. Thank you, P.O. Um, and thank you for allowing me to tell something about my favorite subject, radio. Um, um, we run out a bit of time, so I would like to hand over to the next speaker, but not before I've showed you some beautiful slides. Um, as you may know, um, ETCS rollout is, um, let's say, a kind of, um, let's say, not, not easy thing. And what we are going to do is to change the game. So during the deployment of ETCS, um, the radio system, most probably in many countries, will change. Uh, this is not because of we like that, but it's very simple. Uh, GSMR is coming to the end of life. Not today, not tomorrow. It's easy. You can order equipment, you can order support and so on until more or less uh, 2030 and beyond. However, the system will be replaced in the coming years. That means also that following the, uh, the uh, rules for migration and so on and so on, we have to be very careful. So that means that when we are going to introduce um, and suggest and propose the next generation radio system, we have also some other constraints. And that's, for instance, that we would like to limit the impact for the current applications or for the current applicants, like RUs and IMs. Um, and uh, knowing that, it's not a one shot. That means we do not want to change, um, uh, to, to, to keep a very strict system, which is GSMR, which can uh, as an, a really good lifetime. It started in, let's say, uh, 2000, and it will survive until 2030. So that's, that's very stable. But we can expect that in the future, uh, more applications will use uh, radio communication and so on. So we have to offer a flexibility from the beginning, not changing a system halfway, but indeed uh, from the beginning we have to include flexibility. Um, and this means also that there is only one solution currently available which can offer this, and that is just following what's happening on the public market. Every one of you is using, at the moment as today, 
4G phones, uh, 4G small, uh, smartphones. Um, in the previous um, CCRCC, it was maybe only 50%. Uh, two meetings, uh, two um, CCRC meetings ago, um, it was maybe only 10%. So everybody is using today smartphones, 4G, and within a couple of years, maybe already in the next uh, CCRCC uh, conference, you will have a 5G phone. So when we want to follow this, it, it could create a lot of dynamics and unwanted dynamics. So for that reason, it's good to investigate what is the impact on railways. And the challenges we have here is um, relatively extensive. Uh, I don't go to, to tell everything about this. Uh, then we can spend the whole conference about it. But you can see on the last um, uh, column, increasing the amount of applications, IoT, the Internet of Things, and ACT, the always connected train. You can imagine that um, in order to create this and to facilitate this, uh, you need some rules for the game. And it means also that uh, we as agency would like to keep an eye on interoperability, the balance between RUs and, um, and IMs, and of course, keep an eye on the um, industry <clears throat> in the tree itself, of course. And we have to find a way how to create the flexibility. And this is not something what ERA is inventing. Uh, uh, sometimes we are just concluding on what will be done by others. And that will be explained in the next uh, sessions. Um, so for this reason, we have created the EVORA program. This is the evolution of railway radio. This is a program which is not a one-stop, uh, a one single um, step item but we would like to create different steps and it, uh, I don't say it's never ending, but um, with this program, uh, we first would like to uh, set the system definition. Um, what can we expect from the ecosystem, the success of GSMR, how does it interact with GSMR and so on, and with the applications, of course. And then we would like to um, prepare the CCS TSI uh, changes, which are needed, of course, because we are introducing a new technology. And um, finally, we have to, um, uh, for a longer term, so not only after the publication of the TSI, but already earlier, to support um, the ones who would like to use this system. So the digitalization of railways um, can contain a lot of applications. You know more about that than, than I do, but that means that here we need the flexibility. And it means that uh, uh, proper and intensive coordination between all stakeholders is essential. It does not work when only one raises his hand and say, this is the ultimate solution. No, we have to agree upon that. And as you may know, there are very, very different actors. Uh, just to mention from the side back, um, shift to rail Unisic, uh, the telecom supply industry, Rock IG in this case, um, but not only. We have UIC, we have Etsy, and um, not unimportant, uh, CR and EIM, the leasing companies and so on. So we have to include everyone in this uh, playing field and that's the reason why we have uh, made this this program and this program has a very simple roadmap it's not a technical roadmap at least that's not what i'm presenting here um, but it's a very simple roadmap at the end of 2018 next year we will inform the commission about what are the ideas and uh, for the system definition so how does the system looks like what are the preconditions for success and so on and so on uh, to mention, for instance, uh, radio spectrum, uh, technology, and that type of things. And um, in the years after that, we would like to, um, so until 2019, we would like to set in the update of the TSI 2019, the rules for migration. Just to give a simple indication, we have to indicate, for instance, that when you want to switch off GSMR, as I am, you have to notify that um, seven years in advance something like that, this type of simple rules. Um, and in the CCS uh, TSI update, which could be expected somewhere around 2022, we will have the full set of specifications which are needed for interoperability. Um, and it means also that um, for this reason, we have to look carefully to um, what is done by whom. And for this reason, we have a coordination working group and the coordination working group is dealing with uh, this uh, set of activities. And then you see top down, um, of course, it starts with requirements. Then we have to define the conditions for success. Um, the solutions have to be defined and I say solutions because maybe it's not only one. And at the end, uh, not unimportant, and we have already started with that, migration. 
because migration will have a lot of impact, not only technical, but also uh, economical impact, maybe operational impact and so on. Although we would like to limit it, uh, to limit this, this impact, there will be some impact, of course. That's the reason why it is a game changer. Um, this is not all the work. So the, the next um, years following this is about uh, test cases. It's about um, uh, spectrum assignments to have an, a look what is happening in the different member states and so on. And also the uh, the blue part, the solutions, uh, product development. You, uh, a standard without a product does not help you. So with this type of um, uh, overall planning, we try to coordinate. And every one listed in the previous slide, like uh, Shift Rail, UIC, Etsy, and so on, have to take that part in this overall um, schedule. And uh, we are reporting on the progress and the uh, proposed solutions every now and then. So that will be at the end of uh, 2018 and in 2019 a bit, and of course in 2022. Um, this is a very brief picture of um, what we are doing in a uh, well-settled environment. We have a lot of meetings. We have a lot of groups working. Um, you may uh, not be aware, but railway communica radio communication is developed more or less by 3GPP, that's a worldwide project with, uh, they are producing over 40,000 documents yearly and so on. That means that we are cooperating with them, not only the agency, uh, UAC, Etsy, the supply industry and so on. So this means that it is a huge task, but it is about standardization. And the lessons learned from the past is that with appropriate standards, you can create a very stable system. In the next uh, CCRCC, we will, uh, we will tell slightly more about this. And I would like to hand over to uh, the next one, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. I have the pleasure to present to you the work of the Shift to Rail joint undertaking in terms of defining the next generation communication system. So. So as you might know, the Shift Rail joint undertaking is structured in different innovation programs. And there's one innovation program two, which is around advanced traffic management and control systems, which has one technology demonstrator embedded for the adaptable communication system for all railways. So that's the name of Shift Rail for the next generation communication system for railways. And the technology demonstrator is structured to cover basically the whole scope of defining such a new communication system, starting with collecting and assessing the requirements, the user and the system requirements, looking into the different business models, because we can assume in the future there might be not the, the classical legacy model of owning the equipment and the infrastructure, maybe some future innovative approaches. But, and then obviously the main task in that activity will be around specifying driving the standardization of this new communication system. We will also create a document, a guideline document, which will help infrastructure managers to select the right technology options. And then we will start to, to develop different prototypes, which we will then ultimately integrate it into a demonstrator to be used in field trials. That's kind of a long list of activities, which are split into different projects. And the first project out of Shift Rail in IP2 is called Extra Rail 1. And Extra Rail 1 is now, has started more than a year ago. And we're seeing already the first results of Extra Rail 1. For example, in the TD2.1, the adaptive communication uh, area, we have now created a user and system requirements documents, which is actually publicly available. So what are the benefits of Shift to Rail? Oops. Okay. So what are the benefits of Shift to Rail in terms of defining a communication system? I think the key is the communication system acts as an enabler, one of the building blocks to support our applications. And Shift to Rail bringing together some key stakeholders from the industry, from the, the operator side, from uh, infrastructure managers, uh, including academia. So Shift Rail, in Shift Rail, we have a strong collaboration within the projects, between the different activities, between the different tasks, but also between innovation programs. 
between IP2 and IP1, for example. For example, we have the Roll to Rail, one of the Lighthouse projects, and now the connector projects in IP1, which also look into onboard communication systems. So as you see, there's already kind of an overlap between what is done in IP2 and what is uh, going on in IP1. And we have also interaction with other groups. External groups, so certainly ERA is uh, uh, advising shift of rail um, um, activities. Uh, we also have uh, looked strongly into the work uh, created by the USC, the FRMCS project, with the user requirement specification, which is used as, I would say, the main source for the requirements documents created by uh, Web Package 3 and x Rail 1. Once we start the specification and standardization work, obviously we need to feed in to accelerate the standardization through Etsy, through FGP, as already mentioned by Shil. So the result of that activity is basically a system which enables key characteristics for the communication system. And what we want to have is a unified communication system to support different applications, not a single one, not to have a specified system for one application, but to enable the support of different applications, different application categories. At the same time, we want to have a clear separation between the applications and the network underneath. So that we need to hide the details of the network from the applications. So the applications come completely decoupled from the network. Another description or word for that is barrier independence. You might have heard of it. And that barrier independence will happen in the infrastructure, on the infrastructure side, as well as on the train on board. Last but not least, and actually supported by the barrier independence, we will have the support of multiple access technologies at the same time. So we will, support, we will be able to support not just one radio technology, but um, several different radio technologies. That will be important, first of all, to ensure that any emerging new technology can be easily be supported. But at the same time, we are able to combine, to aggregate different radio technologies concurrently. So that will help us, for example, to increase redundancy, but also just to increase throughput if required, if one technology is not sufficient to address the needs of an application. So that's basically the system where we want to really ensure that the applications just request a communication service from the communication subsystem. But anything, any kind of functionality or any kind of uh, method, methods in, in the system is more or less hidden from the application. So the application can act independently from the underlying radio technology. So when we talk about different applications we want to support, obviously we have different categories. We will have mission critical applications, but also non mission critical applications. So different applications have different needs and those needs to be supported by one system. At the same time, I mentioned it before with the business models, we need to support different operational models. So what we have having today mainly is a dedicated network, but in the future we will have a network, an access network on a shared basis to be shared with similar user groups or even shared with uh, 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 other railway uh, infrastructure managers. Up to a model where we want to support a network as a service uh, business model. And similar, I think the network as a service would be kind of a satellite communication, which would also act as one of the uh, potential physical barriers you want to support. So to conclude, the shift to rail work package fee, so the work done for the TD2.1 adaptable communications aims for overcoming the limitations, the constraints of the, the existing communication system in ERTMS. The barrier independence will be very important and will be enable the, the, the support of multiple applications and, and the independence of those applications from the network as well as the support of different access networks from one communication system. We need to ensure that we are backward compatible, so we have to have a, a migration path and transition path 
from the existing GSMR systems towards the future system. As well as support different operating models. So as I said, the network as a service uh, approach would be one, and actually the most challenging one, uh, to enable different communication services in different environments. And ultimately, and I think that's also very much linked to the other activities in the Shift to Rail program, I think some of them you will see in later presentations, is that we want to support new innovation, new services for railways. So, thanks to you. Yes, our next speaker will be Michael Glocker, who is the head of the solution management uh, and also in X to Rate 1. Yeah, thank you, Pio. So, my presentation today is uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, industry group. So, I'm working in, in, in Nokia and we are uh, since the beginning part of the of the industry group, Ravi operational, uh, operational industry group. Uh, and we, I will present shortly our view on, on the way towards the next generation, what we see as uh, an important guideline to follow, and especially what we can do as a, a group of vendors uh, uh, in, the, in the area of GSMR since 2000 already, what we can do to support a smooth migration towards a next generation system, what we are doing already in some part of our networks, in our technology, in our products, and uh, where we are supporting, for example, in the uh, specification work, where we can bring a lot of uh, experience into the work, as you've seen already uh, by the presentation of Ulrich Geier uh, this morning. Uh, why is it now? Okay, as you can see, this is now a long pass when we have started with uh, legacy analog systems and in 2000. Uh, and you can expect as a network uh, a supplier in this business, uh, this statement that this was a wise decision to select GSMR, not only because of the success of GSMR, we have now since 2000 in Europe, but not only in Europe, but also outside Europe. Uh, most of the important thing is that we are now be part of a big global telecommunication system, the most successful system, as Jill mentioned, defined by the 3GPP. And the benefit for sure is not only to have a, a, a stable, reliable and a, a full functional system, but also by this approach, selecting GSMR in 2000, we implicitly can now follow the further evolution that we can see in the public market with the standardization in 3GPP. And by this, we are now can utilize the mechanisms that are there in these standards to ensure an interoperable transition. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, not have a big bang, like for example, the step from the legacy system to the GSMR system, but rather a smooth migration, an evolutionary step. The second thing is uh, protecting the investments we did already. Yeah, all the sites that we built already, uh, how can we reutilize the, the uh, installed base and the products? Uh, at the end, uh, to get a system which, by definition, if supporting and if following the 3GPP path, is again an interoperable system, because this is the guideline of uh, any mobile uh, uh, communication system nowadays used in the public market. Um, what we took as the main requirements, I, we heard it already also due to the activities and the shift to rail, is uh, so-called the application-based realization of the new system, flexible. New applications can be added on top. Um, we should not support, as in the past, only one radio bearer. We want to have a flexibility to add other bearers, uh, whether this is a, a different mobile technology, 3GPP-based, non-3GPP-based, like Wi-Fi, or even fixed communication or satellite. Um, we are targeting with a new system, not only to have a system for the main line, but we also want to address the, uh, the urban line, metro line, or the freight line. We did this also with GSMR in the past, but, but uh, we have not been that successful. We have seen today these Thames links uh, uh, approach, which is for sure a success story. We have other areas, uh, but with a new system, we get uh, hopefully a much more broader economy of scale due to have an addressable system for also other markets, not only focusing to mainline. And for sure, it should not only be a European system, we should have the same success as we had at GSMR 
also with the system running uh, outside Europe. Um, and for sure, interoperable, interworking with GSMR. And this is the nature of following this uh, standardized approach. Um, interoperability is part of this. Uh, reliability and robustness. We are building on systems which are serving millions of subscribers, also with a very high reliable requirements. For sure, we have different requirements for railways, but we have a very solid base we can build on. Uh, we already have in these standards now, in the public market standards, in the 3GPP standards, architectures which allows very flexible uh, uh, pro provisioning and orchestration of applications. So the mechanisms are there already in the public market. We now need to see what we can use and build on these standards uh, uh, for our railway architecture. Uh, multiple service uh, uh, radio technologies in, in also the mobile operator, the public operator, they see uh, with the license spectrum, they cannot fulfill the demand. So they are already providing mechanisms how to aggregate and keep, a, a, for example, a Wi-Fi network together with an LTE network. So this can be aggregated either in the core or even in the, in the radio network. Uh, quality of service, for sure, it's part of the standards. And what is the good thing where we can rely on? The 3GPP also took now the responsibility to serve mission critical communication. We have dedicated standards which are now dealing for mission critical communication, first addressing public safety market, but for sure mission critical is not only public safety, it's the same for us for railways. This is what we see as the uh, benefits if we are enhancing the economy of scale with such a solution. Okay, this is uh, some of the discussions that are currently ongoing within TCRT. Uh, flexible architecture based on the new uh, system. So this is one view how to, to build this. We discussed this in ETCS, TCRT with the vendors uh, of the industry group, with other vendors, uh, where you can see that we have these flexibility in application. We have an application layer, which is not only dealing with special railway application, but also we are now extracting what we have built in before into, into the GSMR network, in the core, in the radio, we want to abstract this now, and we are putting voice services, group communication services, dispatcher services, also on, on application layer so that we keep the infrastructure independent, so the core and the radio network infrastructure, and by this one, also 3GPP allows to connect different radio technologies, non-radio technologies, the first time, uh, and uh, for sure uh, accessing and serving various of, of mobile devices. So this is uh, work ongoing, this is a view we have. Uh, for sure we have variances we can discuss and we are supporting here in all of the relevant standardization bodies, whether this is Etsy, whether this is 3GPP, and for sure working together with ERA and, and URC and other stakeholders. Okay, so what can we do as uh, industry to support this? For sure, uh, the products that we are deploying already today, we can show that there is a migration path, that there is a flexibility, because they are also following what I've meant before, 3GPP technology, and they are by nature supporting then also migration steps, because this, this was done as part of the product base. Um, we, we know that ETCS has a long roadmap until 2050. So how to support this? ETCS over GPS is, for example, the first step where we are introducing packet technology already uh, to make ETCS then also a success uh, going from a circuit switch technology. Uh, standardization, TSI, certification support, I mentioned already. Um, there are already trials uh, with railways, whether this is on main lines, for example, in, in Asian countries, in Korea or China, or whether this is in, in, in metro lines and uh, also across Europe, where specific technologies like uh, LTE radio, like a group communication, like CCTV is already in test in pilot phases. So we can prove already that uh, uh, networks can serve different uh, requirements of bandwidth, of uh, scalability, of quality of service. The last point, I guess, in line with, with CHIL, the spectrum is for us for sure also important, especially for the mobile devices uh, on how to build products that can be suitable for, for the next years to come. These are some of the examples. I do not want to go into detail. Uh, I can only say that the products that we are currently deploying on the network, in the core network, 
they are introducing IP technology. They are introducing, they are based on IT technology. They are going even into virtualization cloud environment. Uh, radio technologies that we are supporting now, the latest ones, supporting several standards or can be enhanced, can be flexibly collocated on sites because they are not old rec style BTS but small form factors. We are benefiting here from the public market. Uh, dispatcher environment already capable to handle different uh, uh, domains in their control rooms. On the CAP radios, we have already architectures now uh, are going to be implemented or planned where you can plug in uh, uh, different modules for different radio technologies. So this is the first step and it's important to see what, what, what modules are really needed at the end. And as I've said, uh, mission critical communication, voice over LTE, for example, as an example for the new technology, this is already to a big extent standardized. So we do not need to have a lot on top. We will not uh, reinvest the, the wheel here. My last slide, closing words. Um, yes, for sure we are committed. We have been committed to make GSMR a success. We will support it. And we are also based on our experience can support a smooth transition. Uh, we think following a standardization, standardized way with 3GPP is a very good way to follow, to still benefit from such a community, from such a big economy of scale. And uh, as a last word, we made a GSMR a success. Let's continue then uh, with FIMCS as well. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for the, the words. Let's continue with FRMCS, because indeed we have here the project manager from the USC, also for Metro Rail, for this project, Dan Mandok. Hello, everyone. So I was asked to speak today strictly about the project, not about the details, but many things have been said, and I think it's important to, um, to look on them. And um, so... FRMCS is the continuation of, of, of GSMR. It stands for Future Railway Mobile Communication System, and it has been designed as the successor of GSMR. Uh, we work on this system, and as you probably know, it's one of the game changers. Now, I tried to understand when we discussed in, in, in the Brussels conference, it is a game changer for railways. It is a continuation for ERTMS, and that's why I understand the reticence to understand what does it mean as a game changer. But I will not stay a lot on it because I just want to explain what we want to deliver as UIC. UIC has decided to tackle this issue by launching a project, by having a project working on it. Um, and this project has, has as a scope to actually provide the overall technical preconditions for FRMCS. So to, to achieve that, we work first of all on the three main things to deliver to be able to build all the platform, which is user requirements, which is a system architecture, and the frequencies that we need, because the radio system needs frequencies, of course. Then we intend to provide together with ERA and with the stakeholders a first draft of the functional requirement specification, which is very important, because then we can build the system afterwards. Uh, we have to investigate a real high number of issues and opportunities, and they were named before, and I really love the, the slides from shift to rail showing all those things together. It is about the, the, the network model, it's about sharing infrastructure, sharing spectrum. We're going in a different world. It's going to be a different thing. And not, not to forget about the application layer, and I'll speak about this in the next slide. And also it's about the migration strategy. We have to support ERA to be able to deliver the migration strategy. We have delivered the frequency needs. We are working on the network model, which is what I call the part of, is it your network, part of the network, virtual network. And, and we're keen to prove and to make sure that this system is interoperable with GSMR and give the implementer flexibility. Just a short insight on how we're organized. Um, we have, of course, a steering committee and we, we answer to Eric, which is the members of UIC taking care about governance of the UIC GSMR FRMCS projects currently, and to UIC headquarter, of course. But we have also three groups working on functionalities, architecture, and spectrum. On functionalities, we have delivered user requirements. We are deriving use cases from them, and I'll get to this part and explain it. 
and um, we this group is going to prepare the functional requirement specification first draft as a very very small bracket it won't be the same functional requirement specification because it's about a different system um, architecture is about the technology survey onboard truck side onboard and truck side architecture model and security let's not forget security we're going in a different world and frequency what was the biggest problem and now we have some hopes is about obtaining the frequencies to make this system successful now i wanted to put here some challenges and i might stay here one and a half minutes ish shorter if i can so the most important thing on the challenges is that etcs bear independence and i'd like to state the proposal policy it's not about i want to use any technology i want no it's about when I change the radio layer, I'm not affecting truck side and onboard ETCS. When I go from GSMR to FRMCS, I don't want to reauthorize my fleet. I don't want to put the talk at standstill because I have to change the radio system, which is 1% of this business case to build this system. So ETCS bear independence following this policy is a necessity. And this has to be done as soon as possible. Of course, the system is following the current operational rules. There will be a development in the future, but today we build the system based on today operational rules and has to be future proof, a good quality of service, secure, cyber security, physical security has to be cost effective. And the game that was discussed before, which helped me to get here is about the ratio between equipment an application, equipment, an application. Everything the application, future proof system. Everything the equipment, we meet again in two years, change the system. We have to go there one way or another one. What are we doing as UIC? So we are maintaining the user requirement specifications. We are delivering use cases for 3GPP. 3GPP is a global organism delivering the 3, 4, and 5G standards and building this system. We keep saying 3GPP and TCRT, and we're getting you confused. I think we are 5% telecom guys in this room, so we have to explain this a bit better. We are doing this work with 3GPP to have a standardized off-the-shelf system together with ETSI TCRT. The chairman is here, Robert is in the room. Technical Committee for Railway Telecom. We have the luxury to have a group working for railways in Etsy, and that's a very big thing for us. We want to deliver a functional requirement specification, deliver a system architecture which is flexible, deliver a system requirement specification with ERA, the system authority, always, and with the stakeholders and with the suppliers. Does it work? Is it affordable? Are we going too far with our dreams? we have to start investigating the development and test approach for the apps it's a new world for us should we have a emergency call application for europe should we have different models well we you don't want to have 27 racks in in europe because it's going to be quite quite a nightmare the technical migration strategy and work on the frequencies we have delivered the model now we are working with the commission to obtain them and all these coordinated with stakeholders and partners. And my last slide is about the roadmap. Everything I said put on deadlines. A few milestones is, first of all, we want to start next year or end next year, let's say Q1, Q2, to work on the functional requirement specification. We are extremely focused to deliver the use cases for the next 3GPP 5G release, release 16. We want to support ERA in the information of the system definition on the commission. We want to push the frequency guys to, from the commission to give us frequencies faster than, than the target, which means I want them end of next year, not in 2019, it's going to be too late. Working on rooming and sharing options, migration concept, discussing a business case, why are we changing FRMCS? It's not about obsolescence. It's much more than that, and there's no time for this today. Work on application that we, we want to start working on them in Q1, Q2 next year, and then testing and a proof of concept somewhere in the period shown here. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot. I think that uh, we have seen uh, how the plan for ensuring GSMR future and present is taking into account all the different applications that we are seeing in addition to ETCS. And in fact, the next uh, presentations uh, will be about level three and about ATO, possible clients or apps for the communication system. So I will ask Simon Chadwick and Walter Malfate from Shift to Rally from the agency to take the floor, please, for the next session. Hello, nice afternoon. So Simon and me, we will give you some information on the activities that are ongoing on ETCS level three. When baseline three release two was voted, I have received a nice task also to look a little bit to the longer term and to look to what could be the future evolution and level three came out as one of the game changers. First of all, I want to repeat why we see this uh, ETCS level three as one of the game changers for the evolution and for the future. This is the business and migration objectives. So from a business perspective, level three, and why are infrastructure managers highly interested, could lead to a significant, significant capacity increase. We will see some examples later. Uh, and this capacity increase is mainly linked that we can have shorter virtual blocks or a moving block. So, this capacity increase is of an important business value, and it was one of the elements that drove also other game changers, like we will see later on ATO, that infrastructure managers can have congested infrastructure and are looking for innovations to increase further the capacity. A second business objective is what was mentioned also for other game changers. Game changers. We have to reduce the costs of the complete railway system. And train detection systems, if I look to examples, they represent sometimes up to 20% of a global renewal of a signaling program. So this 20%, if we can have less or no train detection systems are quite relevant. A third business value is related to punctuality and resilience. If I go back to my history when I worked for Infrabel, I knew from all signaling delays that more or less 30% were linked to train detection systems. It's also for maintenance people always difficult that they have to go inside the field along the line which could be far from a maintenance center, so they lose also quite some time before they are at the right location. So. Here we also see an important aspect that uh, without uh, or with less train detection systems, we can further improve the punctuality of the complete railway system. These are the benefits. On the other side, we have to take into account how can we achieve this. And we have, what was also said in the longer term, really, really to protect the existing onboard ETCS investment. It's from our use repeated several times that uh, once they have invested, they want to protect this investment. So we have to take care on how we migrate, similar as was explained by Kiel, uh, that we have to look to the migration strategy and the planning. Simon will clearly explain the different ETCS level three concept, but from a migration point of view, we see that in fact there are two ways uh, how it is approached in the different uh, activities that are ongoing today. You could see, first of all, that the onboard train integrity management system could be something optional, or it could be something mandatory if you make no use anymore of any train detection systems. Besides uh, these two migration strategies, there are quite some technical challenges that are addressed in shift to rail. Therefore, I hand over to Simon to explain 
all the work being done. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Simon Trevick. You've seen this paper here because of my role in Swift Rail as well being blocked the next rail one. I'm good. It's in the point of an Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and uh, how we're doing it, and a little bit about dates and where we're going to get to. Uh, one of the first things that was agreed when we started on our work package five, very early on, was agreed that uh, we would actually be covering more than one type of system. And these four diagrams here show us the different types of systems. So we're taking as our base case what some people would think of as a moving block system, that is no train detection and a full moving block system. The movement authority of this train is where behind the safety margin of the train in front. That's fine for capacity. Why might I want this? I might want it because of all that removal of train track vacancy detection that Wouter was just talking about, for example. I might want it to achieve maximum capacity. Second one is as, as above, but this time we will have some track vacancy detection. Maybe not everywhere, maybe just in some places. Why might I want to do this? I might want to do this because I might want to have um, a performance improvement in some places where I can release parts of the railway faster than I can through the train position reports. I might want to do this because I have sometimes to put some unfitted trains in my network, or maybe for migration. The third and fourth types have what we call fixed virtual blocks. The railway is divided, so there's an engineering task in here, uh, into these virtualized blocks. Um, why, might want to, might, why might I want to do this? Well, actually, it was mentioned earlier on about the wider system context, and this provides much less of a challenge to the rest of the system. For example, uh, for the control system, is it more like a traditional control system or train describers and all these other parts of the system? Uh, so it's it's closer to today, if you like. I lose a little bit, tiny bit of capacity because I work on these virtual blocks. The fourth one is, as above, the virtual three, but with the tra track vacancy detection. Why might I want to do this? Uh, I didn't mention here, but another reason for the track vacancy detection is about recovery or initialization or proving there's no train after an incident in some way. Uh, so. Why might I want to do this? I might want to have a high capacity at the peak hours with the trains all operating in the level three way. And outside the peak hours, I might want to run other trains. Or it may be part of a migration pattern. This one, uh, and for those of you following this part of this story, is this very similar or the same as the hybrid level three, which is uh, being pursued uh, by Intimacy of the group today. Okay. The next. So that was the first, was the scoping type of thing. Oops, I missed one. Okay. So uh, this was just some of the challenges. So train fitment, it says here, all trains need to be ETCS fitted. So I just gave you some examples. Maybe not, depending on which type of system you're following. Train integrity monitoring, just to be clear, this currently is part of extra rail 2 and uh, the separate work package for this, so we need to make contact. So Extra Rail 2 just started in September. System recovery, how to achieve recovery without the track vacancy detection and to achieve it also in some reasonable time. Uh, if you want to sweep the whole railway, that's fine. It might take quite a long time for long distances. Not necessarily a good solution. And the performance, I already mentioned the area where performance uh, can be improved maybe some by use of some track detection if necessary. Another thing we agreed second quite quickly was uh, about the architecture we're considering. Uh, we mentioned just now about uh, preserving the investment so far. So uh, this is uh, consistent with ETCS, if you like, as it is today. Uh, start point is the baseline three release two, plus the change request 940, which is important for the level three story. Um, and here is our view of the architecture from our work package five. And really, we care just about onboard and track site and the environment they sit in. It has here train integrity management, has here maybe optional track vacancy detection interface with dispatcher. And driver is here, which means that current work in Extra Rail 1 is really uh, appropriate up to GOA 2 
Uh, we've been in discussion with the ATO work package. Uh, maybe the, if we have no driver, we have to do some more work in a later phase. But go. This is how we're doing the work. Uh, we're doing the work by making a bunch of scenarios that are depicted up here. Uh, we've done about three quarters so far of the first pass, but we're now working on a second pass with looking in more detail in slightly smaller groups, slightly smaller groups, <laughs> um, uh, to follow through the detail to try to extract from that the detailed uh, system requirements and, and engineering rules and operational rules, and also including some safety analysis tasks in that, which leads to the deliverables here, which pull out from the information I was just saying from the scenario descriptions. These are the dates currently in the grant agreement for, extra, for us to deliver. Slight health warning that we've also been invited to participate in, in the trance in uh, 2018 as work package five, and we may just ask for a small delay to a similar time. Beyond 2018, okay, this is where there may be extra L2 has just started. We have to make contact with the train integrity and train location, work packages in there. Extra rail three, maybe we get further into the prototyping well. Uh, and it's also planned originally in extra rail five, some work on the block. So, I think at this point I hand back to Uta. Thank you, Simon. So, you saw what was the planning of the shift to rail. So, now is the question when does ERA step in? Recently, beginning of September, we started uh, with a small work group to plan the scope, how we can coordinate and integrate the different level three activities ongoing. As Simon mentioned, also, we see that there are, let's say, two work streams within the different level three concepts. First of all, from the work group, we realize that within Network Rail, ProRail, we also heard it this morning from RFI in Italy, that the hybrid ETCS level three concept is considered as a quick win. Why is this already explained? The challenges of fast system recovery are covered because we still keep the, the current train detection systems. And the main challenges are to, to develop a TIMS for passengers where today, uh, in network rail, pro rail, there is a pilot already testing this in the field, uh, which takes place, uh, I think, one of the upcoming months, where they will demonstrate that this hybrid level three concept can work with, and this is the very good news, with the current set of baseline three release two specifications and this change request that 940 that is already in the technical opinion that uh, will be explained tomorrow which was a, a clarification on how to interpret uh, the minimum safe rear end uh, definition so this is the very good news for me that uh, in fact uh, the baseline 3 release 2 is suitable for this hybrid level 3 concept and in fact normally from era side there are not any additional activities required on specifications. Of course, we uh, want to make it uh, visible that this is achievable without any change to the current set of specification. So we still have to define in the last meetings how we will communicate and disseminate this hybrid level three concept. And of course, ERA as part of the Ford railway package will deliver once this hybrid level three comes into a commercial tendering phase, a track site decision for this track site uh, hybrid level three deployment. Then on the shift to rail, where uh, Simon clearly explained that the base case is the full moving block without any train detection system. Here, the ERA has to disseminate once the results of shift to rail are available to disseminate this uh, to the broader, let's say, the, the complete railway sector and to organize some workshops, mainly to see how the challenges that were, uh, that has been discussed about fast 
system recovery without any train detection systems can be handled? Will this be done by technical export constraints? Will there be maybe operational constraints? So this is one of the elements that we will plan uh, next year also workshops to disseminate the shift to rail results on the full, let's say, level three concept without any train detection systems. And here then we have to work together um, to align how far this can also uh, lead to any potential things that has to be incorporated for the CCSTSI update in 2022 for the which is completely coherent with the other game changer on FRMCS where we have the same time planning. So this is what we intend to do for the next years. We start a very interesting journey um, and we look forward to all your contributions on that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the other game changer we're going to discuss now is ATO. And we have two distinguished guests, Benoit Bienfe, who is the leader of the work package in Shift to Rail. And I think he will have a presentation together with Hans. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Benoit Bienfe, working for Alstom, currently uh, in charge of the ATO over TCS program inside Alstom, but I'm also leading the uh, in shift to rail the work package relating to ATO up to G Wave 4. Uh, first of all, just to remind what is ATO over TCS? Uh, ATO uh, can be seen as an add on over TCS, permitting to operate the trains and the network. Uh, automatically with as less as staff as possible, uh, receiving information coming from the control center, the traffic management system, typically a timetable information relating to the next passing points, stopping points, with the expected arrival time and passing times. Uh, and the uh, ATO is uh, operating automatically, uh, arriving on time according to the constraint def def uh, defined by the control center but also minimizi minimizing the energy consumption. The most important uh, benefits of ATO over TCS, sorry, I have to go back. Voilà. These are first the performances, the fact that with ATO we can suppress all the uh, reaction time due to the, the driver. So there is an impact on ETCS to permit the train to be close as, uh, as possible to the uh, intervention curve. So it is possible to operate with a headway which is uh, minimized comparing to uh, an operation with a driver. It permits also to reduce the uh, travel time, the dispersion, the dispersion in the travel time. And this permits the operator to reduce the margin to be put in the timetable to uh, foresee these random uh, travel times. Once more, it permits to operate more trains on the same uh, time interval on the same infrastructure. Uh, the second type of um, interest is the quality of service with a better punctuality by definition and also a greater comfort. And finally, uh, or we can also reduce the operating cost, reducing the energy, as I said, but also reducing the train fleet and staff necessary to uh, operate a line. Uh, for a given uh, operational service. Just to remind uh, for the people who don't know, uh, there are different grades of automation uh, already defined in the urban application, but we reuse the same uh, definition for mainline. The first one is uh, the grade of automation one. It is the current situation with an ATCS supervising the train, but the train is always controlled completely by the driver. Uh, the second step is the GOE2, where the driver is still on the cab, but he pushes on a push button and the train is driven automatically until the next stopping point, uh, minimizing the energy consumption and arrival on time. The third level of automation is driverless, so there is no driver anymore in the cab, but there is still somebody in the train to support the degraded modes and to uh, help the passengers in case of. 
And finally, the last uh, level is the Great Rotation 4, which is unattended. There is nobody on the train except passengers and uh, or freight. Uh, one specific uh, grid of automation is for mainline. We have added the G1 Plus, which is uh, the CDAS, uh, the driver advisory systems. The driver is still there, still uh, driving the train, but uh, the driver has indications coming from the system permitting uh, him to follow the most optimum speed profile to minimize energy consumption. So the, the, the work we are doing new, now in uh, shift to rail is to standardize the ATO and the CDAS functions. This is the, the, the history and where we are. Uh, we have started to work in the context of the 10 t program uh, more than five year, years ago. Uh, we have worked a lot with the users group representing uh, several operators. Uh, and they have defined the operation concept, operation requirement, uh, relating to the uh, ATO over TCS, and uh, not only the limited to ATO, but the whole signaling system, uh, and covering the different grade of automation from G1 to uh, until G4. Uh, then we have worked with the Unisig people, the suppliers, uh, in collaboration with the users, and we have first extract all the requirements relating to the grade of automation 2 because in the 10 program, we were requested to define an ATO over ETCS, limiting the impact on ETCS. So at the end of this, we have already a first draft of specification, defining the interoperable solution for an ATO over ETCS in G2. And this is now the starting point to develop the different product by the different suppliers, compliant with this specification to realize uh, factory demonstration, interoperable demonstration, and finally pilot test. This is the first work stream in shift to rail program. The first work stream uh, is to develop this product in line with this uh, standard specification and to demonstrate it on a pilot line. The pilot line will be in the UK, a network rail we host us, um, and it will be, as you will see, in 2019. The second work stream is reusing the uh, requirement relating to G3 and G3.4 coming from the users. And we have also started this work. This is the second work stream in shift to rail And this work stream, uh, of course, we start uh, from the beginning uh, to define the solution uh, permitting to manage G3 and G4 um, system, uh, driverless and unattended, based on uh, this uh, specification. And the purpose is also to realize some tests in factory, interoperability tests, and also pilot tests, but it will be more in 2020-22. What is important to say is that we have defined these two work streams because it is obvious today that the GW2 is a quick win solution. Without impacting ETCS so much, we can already achieve a good result in terms of minimizing the headway, minimum headway, and also minimizing the energy consumption. So it is available right now. We just have to discuss with all the suppliers and users about the interoperability principles because G2 technology is already existing. Uh, but we have to agree on the way to use it in an interoperable way. While the second uh, work stream it is a more long-term perspective, and so we don't have to wait to have this uh, quick win. Just to show what uh, could be this quick win, I, I present here some results that we have uh, done with uh, Infravel uh, on the previous project on a train simulator, which is used by the SNCB, so the Belgian Railways, uh, to uh, train their drivers. And you can see here differences between an automatic operating uh, operation of the train and manual one. This is the first example in intercity operation. You have here uh, roughly 30 kilometers, and this is the distance, and you have here the speed profile. You can see here the static speed profiles and the maximum train speed here. And then you can see different curves. These ones are manual driving, and this one is uh, an automatic driving with an ATO. And you can see, uh, first of all, that the behavior of the driver are quite different. Some of them are breaking more earlier than the others and so on, because the character is different. And you see clearly that we could achieve different type of um, uh, travel times. 
on this example, we have kept only um, figures with the same travel time. And you can see that we can compare here the distances here and the energy consumed here and the accumulated energy consumption between the ATO operation and the manual one, you could have in intercity uh, operation uh, roughly 15% of wind. It is not statistically representative, it is on one line or one type of train, but with different drivers. The same type of figures in local operation where the train is stopping everywhere, you see a different little interstation with roughly two, three kilometers. And of course, the behavior of the driver has a bigger impact on the final result. And you see the same here, you have automatic uh, running and then here different manual driving. In this type of operation, you can see the energy consumed, accumulated. Between automatic driving and manual driving, you can have 40-45% uh, of wins. So once more, it is not statistically representative, but the figures are quite representative. Quite impressive, pardon. What about the time scale? Uh, we are here in the Shift to Rail project program. Um, as already said before, there are different grants. So for ATO, we are uh, um, concerned by the first grant, X2 Rail 1, and the third one, X2 Rail 3. In X2 Rail 1, you see here the different uh, activities with the two work stream I spoke about. First, the work stream is relating to GOA 2, and the second one is relating to GOA 4, 3 and 4. For GOA 2, as I said, uh, we have now completed the specification with ERA. We are working with them to approve what we have uh, already specified with the other partners, the users and the suppliers. Um, it is supposed to complete at the end of this year, so it will be more or less achieved because uh, the final date would be probably March of the uh, next year. Uh, in parallel, the different suppliers have already uh, started the development of their product. And uh, the um, test bench in factory, interoperable test bench, will be uh, completed before end of 2018. It is important this phase. Two uh, references bench will be provided, one by Siemens and another by Alstom. And on these two test benches, we will mix the different solutions coming from the suppliers on board, uh, coming from Siemens, for example, Trackside coming from Bombardier or Thales, this type of thing. So this is already foreseen today, and it should be completed end of 2018. And the final activity for uh, GOE2 is the pilot test that should be completed at mid-2019, as I said, hosted in uh, UK. For the, the GOE 3 and 4, you can see here that at the end of the first uh, grant, x 2 rail one we will have already a first set of, um, of uh, specification, but the actual work will continue and will be completed in 2022. Oh, wait. It doesn't obey too. Oh, yeah, voilà. uh, just a word on the architecture. This is the architecture we have now for GOE 2. Very quick, uh, you see here the different subset. Subset 125 defines the different requirements, functional requirements to be interoperable on ETO for the onboard and track side. Here we have the 126 interface between track and train. This is our specification for the World Package 3, adaptable communication. Um, Michael spoke about that just before. Uh, we have also a standard interface with the train. This will be the specification with the connector people in IP1. So you see that we are very consistent inside shift to rail. We have also a standard interface with onboard recording device. A standard interface very important between ETCS onboard, of course, and ETO onboard. And that's it. Uh, it is the most important document. Uh, I'll let you see it later on. Um, involvement of agency, you can see also uh, from your site. Uh, we want for them to participate to our meeting and to approve our document, and the conclusion, if the things okay to me. Yes. Uh, ATCS, ATO over ATCS will permit to increase on potential capacity without huge infrastructure investment, permits to reduce energy consumption, to reduce operating cost. Uh, GOE2 permits already to have a quick wins relating to uh, the operation cost uh, limit with a limited impact on ATCS and the involvement of agency is required to validate the interoperability and interchangeability of our solution, and also to master the impact on ETCS. Yes. Thank you.
seems there's a problem. I cannot move back. Thank you. It's too much back. Okay, can I take now the control? <laughs> Good. Um, thank you, Benoit, for what for your explanation. More or less everything is said concerning the development. And unfortunately, I have only a few minutes left, so I have to speed up a little bit. Um, I want to, to come back to the challenges of ATO. Um, we can do it quick. Uh, first, no business case, no ATO. That must be clear because it's an option. It's not something which is mandatory, which is imposed. Um, we have to deal with the safety, where to put this, the safety part. For sure, we have to be interoperable, which is also a certain challenge. And we have to think about, or we have to deal with the migration, the upgrading, and so on and so on. The guiding principles I want to skip because it was already said, and I think it's obvious what is written here. Um, what is the involvement of the agency, or let me say, what have we done? We have made a stakeholder survey, and this is more or less the outcome which are the guidelines for our assessment of the shift rail activities which, have Im which may have impact on the TSI CCS. It's clear ATO must be interoperable, no problem for this. Um, ATO should be operational over the whole network. Several stakeholders or CEOs are interested when they invest trackside ATO that the onboard can run over the complete network with ATO. Unfortunately, not the complete network is equipped PDCS. So there must be the possibility in case the national system allow this, in case this would be authorized by the NSAs to run also with the national system on the remaining non-ETCS lines. Um, then it must be possible to have mixed operations, ATO and non-ATO, because it's an issue of migration. The actual fleet normally has no ATO. Um, the, it should, the impact of the solution of the TO2 should be as less as possible. This is something what we are discussing uh, together with shift to rail. It must be also possible that a TO2 train should be able to operate on a TO4 line and uh, that the TO4 line must be able to manage the TO2 train. There was a clear decision that ATO itself, it's not the safety relevant part. Safety, at least in GO2, has to be ensured by ETCS and if possible also in GO4. For GO4, we still have to see how this, let me say, configuration will look like on board and track side in order to see where uh, the additional safety issues uh, should be placed. But the planning is still to have it covered normally via ETCS. Um, I already mentioned this, ADO should be optional, so nobody is forced to implement, to buy ADO. For sure, when it's a business case, everybody, or at least the one who intend to run there, will implement ADO. And what Benoit already explained, the migration plans um, are, have to be developed concerning the GO4, because GO4 will have a big impact, and GO4 we have to see also with Enhanced traffic management with level three, with uh, moving block, all this is more or less linked together. Uh, the agency <laughs> has set up uh, an, yeah, an action plan. We have generated a project, we have generated four um, working groups. It looks a bit complicated, but it's, it's quite easy. Um, you have the, the part which are normally not involved in um, shift to rail, and we, we, we try via work package one to ensure that also the, this, um, the NSAs, for example, the, the operators, Sfera and so on, is involved in this process. We already managed uh, that Sfera has delivered the requirements for the GO2 uh, uh, document. Uh, we have the work package four, this is the most active work package today because the documents which are produced by shift to rail, some of them on one end have impact on EDCS 
and some of them may be part of the future TSI. And therefore, our ECT, uh, which is more or less a change control management of the agency, dealing with uh, the EDCS and GSMR specifications, is involved and is actually reviewing the documents. The second box you see here is the WP3, which is more or less, uh, which is the operational harmonization working group. Uh, in, in addition with uh, drivers, they have to check, to review, to comment the operational aspects. And last but not least, when there is an impact on the TSI and the Annex A, then we have this process the control group, the CCS working party, and afterwards um, the, the TSI itself, uh, which more or less upgrade the, specific, the mandatory specifications. Concerning the time planning, we are a little bit more concerned about the date end of the year. Um, sorry, uh, push too much. Um, these are the three documents which are under review. The SIS subset 125, the, uh, let me say, triple FIS track train, and uh, the FIS today and maybe tomorrow, the triple FIS between ATO onboard and EDCS. According to our, I would say, more realistic planning, we think we cannot finalize before March 2018. This is also because of the shortening of expertise and the amount of comments on the documents, I have to say. Um, we have to decide where we put at the end of the day the documents, either on the Annex A, the application guide, or the voluntary standard. Um, and we see an impact on some Annex A documents uh, already, because when you uh, have a, a connection to ETCS, for sure the SIS is also impacted. The same for the DMI, maybe some other documents. And the Annex A of the TSI operational, which more or less capture the operational rules for ETCS, also there is an impact. That's all from my side. Uh, we are still in time. This is very easy when the speaker is also the organizer of the conference, is very mindful of the timing. Uh, and we have heard a lot about uh, shift to rail. I think it's only befitting that the last presentation is from Claudio Monti, who is the coordinator of the whole IP2 inside shift to rail. Claudio. Well, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to present you what Shift Relay is going to produce in the next and coming years in the railway field. Uh, the aim of presentation today is just to provide you a short summary about which are the main targets and the vision toward the future of railway system and some explanation on the shift to rail approach to achieving our challenging targets. The presentation is more focused on the innovation program two, advanced traffic management and control systems that deals with signaling, automation and telecommunication. So the main topics of the today conference. Let's start from the need. Well, in the past, we had a lot of funded projects, but often what's, what was lacking was the approach system level. So sometimes this produced difficulty to make investment really profitable. And the issue was to have research and innovation fragmentation. So we need to overcome this issue and the answer is a shift rail, I think, to change the paradigm of investment, focusing on the entire rail sector and approaching the matter at system level. This will produce an improving effectiveness of the investment 
an increasing of leverage effect of funding, and which is more important from my point of view, is just to establish a network and common knowledge between the diverse stakeholders. So contributing to achieving the so-called single European railway area. So Shift Rail is a public private partnership ruled under the H2020 and uh, with a total budget around uh, 920 million euros, which means uh, 450 million euros of funding. Well, in Chitole, we have identified three very challenging and concrete objectives that can bring real advantages for passengers and for operators. The targets are to increase efficiency, which means 50% reduction of life cycle cost in the overall stages of the project. I mean, development, production, deployment, and maintenance. 100% increase of the line capacity, improving technology and promoting the new systems, and 50% increase of reliability and punctuality. Uh, all, all these to impact uh, all the rail segment and mar markets, mainline, high speed, regional, urban, and freight. Um, Shift Rail has also other two main objectives, to enhance interoperability. You know that uh, we are starting on the current ERTMS ETCS baseline, but we need to drive the solutions that uh, will be provided by uh, Shift Rail and to manage the impact on the current specification. And the aim is also to contribute to removing the defined TSI CCS open points in the Annex G of the EU regulation, uh, specifically for what regarding the reliability and availability issues. And the second objective, main objective, is to find a methodology that simplifies processes, reducing costs, for, reducing new for introducing new technologies and systems fostering market uptake. Um, the framework. The framework of Shift to Rail is a structure around five assets, specific innovation programs, uh, IPs, that cover all the different structural and functional uh, process of the rail system. These five IPs are supported by working five cross-cutting areas covering teams that are relevant for each of the project and which address and foster the interactions between IPs and the reference subsystems. So briefly, uh, entering in each IP, we have Innovation Program 1, which deal with the trains power electronics, TCMS, a new generation of TCMS, and this in order to increase reliability and reduce cost. Innovation program two, which deal with, with the signaling, automation, and telecommunication, and in order to improve, of course, efficiency, reduce cost, etc. The budget, the budget of IP2 is around 191 million euros. Well, the Innovation Program 2 foresees uh, 11 technology demonstrators that cover almost the entire signaling and automation in telecommunication systems. And here I would like to underline also that we have a wide, very wide participation in Shift to Rail IP2 of the most important European industries and operators. And uh, in the IP2, we have uh, 17 partners with the four operators, Network Rail, Traffic Cat, DB, and, NCC, and SNCF, and the European Consortium Euro. And of course, the most important uh, industries in the field of uh, signaling and telecommunication. 
we have also of course uh, ip2 and ship array is also open to receive contribution from uh, external stakeholders and projects we have the agency we have eug on board unisig funded project uh, like ngdc stars uh, and other important entities all of course contributing to achieving our challenging targets well uh, entering much more detail more detail in uh, each uh, technical demonstrator briefly we have 11 tds in ip2 uh, which title are actually mostly self-explanatory and they can be clustered in uh, signaling supervision systems where we have moving block uh, which aims uh, on the basis of ERTM ATCS to promote that we apply moving block or different kinds of moving block as we saw before uh, achieving high capacity and uh, decoupling the infrastructure from the train uh, performance and so contributing to reduce the use of trackside train detection. Uh, file safe train positioning based on GNSS and again on the basis of ERTMS ETCS uh, we have to define a safe positioning system based on GNSS and also contributing to reduce the number of physical balises on track by using the concept of uh, virtual balise. And then we have virtual coupling. This is uh, something new in uh, the panorama of, uh, of signaling because uh, uh, it aims to explore some innovative concept of virtual trains uh, which are capab capable of operating physical trains much closer to one another uh, inside their absolute braking distance and dynamically modify their own composition on the move. And traffic management system evolution, uh, which aims to enhance the standardization of traffic management processes in order to rationalize automation process and simplify train dispatch operation. We have also specific subsystems, as uh, we saw before, ATO up to, up to GOE4, that on the basis of ERTMS ETCS aims to implement automatic driving up to the highest grade of automation. On board train integrity, uh, which aims uh, to detect on board the, the position of the tail and uh, the integrity on train without the interaction uh, with the trackside equipment. And the radio connected object controller, which uh, aims to provide a distributed control of remote trackside objects, such as uh, points, uh, level crossing uh, signals, and others without the need to uh, lay down cables uh, and to have wire between uh, interlocking and the object controllers. We have proce process processes and testings, um, zero on-site testing that uh, aims to minimize uh, or to reduce uh, to zero the on-site test, the need to have on-site test. So we need to improve as much as possible lab testing capabilities. And of course, to define a common and dedicated system and architecture and methodology uh, for lab testing uh, to have also a common test process and framework. Formal methods. So the aim is in, to introduce in, uh, in our system and uh, uh, the formal and standardization process for the definition or the requirement for designing for verification and validation so for all the stages or the phases of the v-cycle senelec v-cycle and at least at, at the last we have the communication and data protection so the adaptable communication for oral railway as we saw before in detail 
to overcome the current limitation of GSMR, and cybersecurity to define a cybersecurity system and methodology dedicated to a railway. Well, so uh, the five innovation programs, <laughs> five innovation programs and the cross cutting activities become real projects and real objectives and planning within the timeline of shift rail. So in total now, today, we have around 38 projects uh, and around 18 call for member projects. And for IP2, we have planned five projects, one project per year from uh, 2016 up to 2020. Well, which are the most important steps? The first important step is uh, the technology demonstrator that uh, uh, is essential to consolidate the basic requirements uh, and to prove the technology by means of uh, prototypes and simulators. The second important step is uh, to integrate together technology that are coming from different technologies in order to provide a concrete application. And the third step is a so-called system platform demonstrator that aims to bring solution to maturity with application in the main market segments. Also, I speed line, I join our urban freight. A short view regarding about the, the planning of, uh, of IP2. And if, if we focus on IP2, we have uh, the 11 TDs that are distributed within five projects from Israel 1 to Israel 5, uh, according to following structure that we can uh, uh, see here. Uh, six TD started on September last year, so in uh, 2016. Um, they are communication, adapter communication, ATO up to GR4, moving block, zero set testing, and uh, radio connecting object controller uh, and cyber security. A new uh, four TD uh, starting this year in uh, 2017 in Story 2. Uh, so today we have uh, 10 out of 11 TDs that uh, have, have started. Uh, only one TD will start in uh, 2018, and it is the virtual coupling. We have also open calls, and now they are linked with the, uh, most of the TDs that uh, we have in IP2. No. <laughs> okay. I, I try to speed up. Well, um, now because uh, here it is important, we, we can go here. Just I want to show you. Well, um, voila, okay. So um, this is the, the, the vision of the future of uh, uh, shift rail. And, and the idea is to come up uh, uh, to a set to to have a set of innovative scenarios that we call capabilities, and they address the main needs of the stakeholders and the societal trends, like digitalization, digitalization, urbanization, environment impact, and aging population. The 12 innovative capabilities have digitalization and high level of automation that in their core and they intend to produce value through innovative products, system, and services. So each capability is built by means of a contribution of building blocks. You can see here the building blocks from, that are coming from each TD, and they cooperate together in order to build the structure, the functions, and the operational procedure of the, of the new system. So the intention is to bring the idea into reality through practical 
application able to provide a vision. So just the last one, Pio. Please. Well, um, of course, shift to rail also takes into account the evolution identified in the ERTMS long-term perspective. And so, of course, it is important to, to highlight this because uh, shift to rail is, uh, let me say, the answer of most of the game changers of the of uh, uh, long-term perspective for ERTMS. Well, stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have now covered a lot of grounds, I think, in this uh, afternoon session. We have half an hour for questions and answer. I hope that you have well noted all the different topics that we were covering. Uh, I would be happy then to start taking questions, raise your hand, state your name, and wait for the microphone to reach you. I will ask also uh, the presenters, uh, excluding maybe my colleagues from the agency, to join me uh, there on the on stage, please. All the presenters coming here, it will be easier for the public when asking questions, and uh, we manage the microphone in a, in a better way. I saw there was already a hand raised over there, I think. But, sorry. It's not open. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me this uh, second chance to ask a question. I, I would like to. Uh, raise the question to Mr. Bienfei of Alstom about the, the business case for uh, ATO. We have heard that also the agency is um, is concerned about the need to have a business case. That's you no know, uh, uh, very logic. So um, <clears throat> when we look at that, uh, the differences between GOE three and four. Uh, the only real difference is when the, the system is out of order, so when the, there is some special case to manage. And uh, GOA4 is supposed to do automatically. Uh, this is perfectly possible. We know, you know it, uh, it just takes... Um, so if we look at the um, uh, space-based systems like uh, satellites or interplanetary okay, probes, <laughs> Uh, they are they are just uh, acting this way, but the the matter is how much is the cost, and notably, what is the uh, forcing delta of the cost between the GOA three and GOA four approach in order to realize this automatically, and what about uh, this delta cost uh, with respect to the normal cost of a, of a driver? So, is there any or there will there will be really a business case for GOA4 in the future. So, in fact, this question we have to ask first to the users because they are willing to return for. And so the answer is not so easy to, to give because I will not give you figures for that. What I can say to you is that according to the actual situation, it will be interesting for the users to have GOA3 or GOA4 probably not on all the network, but on some particular cases. For example, there is a big pressure since a long time coming from the user to have already, right now, already in GOA2+, plus, automatic turn back, driverless automatic turn back. And for this, the computation is quite easy to make. If you have the total travel time, it is the, equal to the number of trains miles the headway. If due to the win of time, because you don't have to change of cab and blah, 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 you can win part of percentage of this total travel time, it is the percentage you can win also in the uh, fleet you need. So this is just one example. So for some operator, when it is possible to operate 
without any driver because it's possible to protect the, the track. On this type of turn back uh, uh, location, it is already one business case already for them. Other cases are for the management of the uh, stabling, this type of thing. So it is case by case, and the business case are done by the users. There is some papers they, uh, given by them to define clearly that they need that for them. But I will not give you figures like that. Yes, in, or, in order to complete this, especially uh, GO4 is strongly requested and supported by several railway undertakings. So it seems they see a business case. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthias Müller. I'm from Thales. Um, first of all, thanks a lot uh, to all the speakers for their short but very informative presentations. Um, I especially like the part about radio communications where you mentioned the need of having a gradual approach and not having like a big step from one system to the other. And I want to come to the TCI CCS 2016 and the step from GSM baseline zero to baseline one. That step didn't seem too gradual and my question is to Hans Bierlein. To the constraint you mentioned that um, Germany, the German NSA is giving in asking people that have make a reauthorization um, to, to use the new uh, GSMR based on one system. As I read the TSI CCS, um, you really, basically there's no way around it. So you have to use the GSMR based on one system. Am I mistaken? Uh, this is correct when you authorize. But the trick uh, in this case is that you're already authorized to operate in Germany. It's line specific. And when the line is uh, extended, uh, you are reauthorized. And with this reauthorization, um, you have to use the baseline one. This is a trick. Because normally you should be authorized for an area of use for Germany, whatever. And uh, in case there is a new line placed in service, normally it's the line who has to ensure that everything is interoperable with the already authorized trains, and therefore there is no authorization, no reauthorization needed. This is the point. For sure, when you have a new authorization, you should apply the last version of the TSI, which is the 2016 with baseline one. Okay, you can ask for derogations, but the member state is uh, can insist that this. TSI will be applied. Um, just a follow-up question. So when we um, change the software of the ETCS system, we would have to make another authorization and that automatically would imply even for old projects that we have to install a new GSMR, right? Theoretically, yes. yes. Thank you. I think this is not the theory, but uh, coming back to the presentation on vehicle authorization that was given by, by Jean-Francois, I, I think that this re-engagement phase, I think, is the key where we should have the discussion between the applicant and the NSAs and the agency on the applicable legal base. I mean, there are valid cases when economic reasons or other can dictate the negotiation or the need to use the previous version of the DSI. I think what is important is that everything is done with the maximum degree of transparency that is possible. Thank you. Yes, Franz. Hi. Uh, maybe not a question, but a tip for Mr. Monti. Uh, on his T7 and TD10, he speaks about uh, radio-controlled object controllers, and he speaks about uh, formal methods. I may give him a tip. Uh, I'm the project director of EU Links initiative, and we're going to publish baseline two in a month from now. Uh, you'll find formal methods there, how you do specifications, how you do requirements, met uh, management, including modeling of your requirements and state machines to execute your requirements. And you also find uh, how we can communicate with object controllers over an IP-based network. So have a look at the website, eulinks.eu. Thank you, Franz. Very good piece of information. I think that we welcome all this kind of contribution. Yes. Robert. Thank you, Robert Schafati. 
Uh, this question to Michael Michelandra presentation regarding sheet to rail. Uh, uh, Michael, I saw that you mentioned the fact that the uh, sheet rail is providing uh, specification for the, in your uh, list of deliverables. Uh, since I know that all the requirements which are addressed are coming through HCTCRT, and I did not discover any new requirement, is, do you mean by that it is the use case which are delivered by the FMCS project uh, as such, and um, so which means that these are the input that you are delivering? I think I mentioned in my presentation that uh, the. No, no, it's the Clo you closer. Okay. <laughs> so I think I mentioned in my presentation that the uh, user and system requirements document, uh, which is now finalized by Web Package Three and Xtrail One, was heavily using the inputs from the UIC FMCS project US document. So you will see a lot of similarities. Even I would say. Uh, yeah, even a copy and paste in some cases. And, uh, but on top, we have now also taken into account the requirements from the other work packages in XRL1, or related projects uh, out of Shift Rail. So I think the scope is, I would say, extended from uh, what is so far in the US ca captured. Thank you for the uh, answer, but I wanted to, uh, it will be useful to everyone that this um, change or any additional thing is clearly indicated because so far I did not find anything different. That's the, the, the reason of my question. So, uh, second question to all the presenters which are de delivering the... Uh, on, you not should be surprised that question is on communication. Uh, I heard that you had... Uh, the communication system qualified, including uh, coming from Hill's plan as well. It could be independent. Uh, in some kind, it's adaptable. And uh, I found also, maybe I, I missed one, but I also I heard about flexible. So I think it would be uh, interesting to, I just can deliver the fact that we, uh, we selected the term flexible in 3GPP uh, for a very simple reason. We, whatever is the name, <laughs> we have to deliver, uh, we have to deliver a system which is interoperable. And so that's the uh, why I strongly, if there is any other reasons, just I wanted, to, this is my question, is there a reason for having three different qualifications for that? Thank you. Well. Thank you for your question, Robert. I think that the, the terms were used in different instances, and I think that you're right, it might create confusion. And I do agree that we have to go for flexible, because if you go to terms, many terms, many names, we get um, in, in, a, in a big confusion. Um, when you speak, for me, when I said bare independence for ETCS, it's just a policy on ETCS independence, whatever the system is. It doesn't mean any system will serve. ETCS and any frequencies will be allowed to work with, and you're absolutely right here. I think there were more context. The questions were, the discussion was about a number of subjects and there were similar terms. Now, because we're going to go in CGPP world, we have to use their language, so the term will be flexible. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, and my name is Peter Brux from the Dutch Ministry. I have a question to uh, Eva. The, the first speaker of Eva explains us the, um, the new system in the fourth railway package eh, that we changed from putting into service to placing on the market and bringing a train in operation. Um, and that um, placing on the market that has to deal with uh, uh, technical compatibility that was also mentioned and that you have to prove technical compatibility with the TSR CCS. In the um, placing in, in, in operation, uh, that's a discussion between infra manager and railway undertaking and then you talk about uh, uh, um, RIMF and TSR operations. My question, 
in, in the morning session, there was a lot of debate about testing uh, procedures for proving compatibility. That discussion, to my opinion, should be limited to placing uh, on the market. And can you confirm that an info manager can't require, is not in the position to request testing uh, to the rail undertakings in the discussion around the operation? Yes, I, I think that clearly there is no legal basis in the directive for a role of the infrastructure manager to define what kind of uh, testing the RU is, the, the, the railway undertaking is obliged to, to undertake. On the other end, I think there is a clear obligation for the infrastructure manager to give a complete description of what is the state of the infrastructure. And today, of course, we have the, you can say, high level approach in which we have description in the RINF, in the register of the infrastructure or the, in the network statement. And we understand or personally understand very well that this is not sufficient in many cases to describe exactly how the ETCS implementation has been done. I find that the possibility to have testing with defined test scenarios that clearly describe how the infrastructure has been built and what is the expected behavior of the trains is the way forward to make sure that we bridge this gap between the description of the infrastructure in the RIMF, which is a bit at a high level and I can say very valid and working very well for sure uh, with the more traditional interfaces that we have with, with rolling stock where we have uh, a very long experience. With ETCS, it is clear that we need an additional level of confidence and of details in the description. So it is not for the IN to impose tests on the RUs. On the other end, I think it will be very valuable, especially given the discussion that we are having with the testing working group in the, as a subgroup of the platform, to come up with a transparent way to ensure that IN defines what are the reasonable tests that must be fulfilled, either in laboratories if possible, or in a test track, or on the line, and that our use can demonstrate that they have been able to pass the test, or the suppliers can demonstrate that the onboard which is installed in the specific trains or vehicles have already passed the test. I think that this is back to the presentations we have seen this morning. We have the two aspects. We have the vehicle authorization, but on the other end, we have also the truck side, authorized by NSAs, but subject to the approval of the agency. I, I think that if we manage not to have a proliferation of truck side standards for the implementation of ETCS, the possibility to do a very limited set of tests is a reality. And I think it could be a good way forward to ensure that uh, we are fully confident on the interoperability. But of course, we have to manage both angles. And again, it is not a matter of IMs have a right to impose on RUs. I think it is the cooperation to ensure the safety interoperability of the system, which is managed under the NSAs and the agency role, that uh, will make sure that there is this cooperation between the two actors. Sorry for the lengthy question, but the, the question is very good. And we have not all the elements to answer that in the detail. Additional questions from the floor? We still have at least 15 minutes before the cocktail. Uh, I think we have received questions uh, via the um, listener or the, the people that were looking at uh, our web interface uh, web stream. I think the first question is again on ATO. It's um, when the interface between the ATO on board and ATO truck side the subset 126, will be included in the TSI? I suppose this is a question for Hans. So. <laughs> in case the final decision is that this interface has to be included, it will be done with the next revision of the TSI, and as already mentioned, this would be, I would say, around 2022. Um, there might be a technical opinion before. Thank you, Hans. Very diplomatic answer. Um, 
The second question we have received uh, from the web is why does the applicant have to indicate all the technical details in an area of use? Why not just mention the line segments in this area during an application? And maybe I will ask then Jean-Francois to take the question or Orhan. Oh, let, let me take it. Um, on one hand, this technical details is not so much. You will see what will be the outcome of our activity. On the other hand, when you want to mention all the line segments you want to operate, uh, I think you need a lorry in order to put all the information in, 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 in a paper version. Because uh, I think a station, a simple station, has 100, 200 line segments. So it's not really practical to mention line segments. And we will try to reduce the number of technical uh, uh, the, uh, of technical details as much as possible. Thank you. Um, the third question, I think, is off topic. I, I will read it in any case, and I suppose that uh, we can address it maybe tomorrow. Uh, I think that maybe this is more a question for uh, the corridors. Is about radio and fill. Is radio and fill, uh, I mean, for level one. British level one not hampering the corridor operation, RFC. I suppose the question is for RFC one, as far as I understand. Uh, Fabio was here this morning, but again, I don't think this is a question for our panel. I write it because I don't want to, I can say, do a disservice to the people that are listening and putting questions for, uh, for us, but it's not for, for this panel here. If I may, I, I had a question for the GSMR industry. Uh, we have listened to the two presentations, I mean the future and, and the present, GSMR and, and the future system. And one of the questions that we hear a lot is about how much of the current investment can be still saved when the new system will be defined. And if I am a railway, that is investing today in a GSMR network, how much of the investment I'm making, especially on the network side, can be saved when migrating to the future system? Is there any way to give an indication on that? Um, no, it, it's for sure a little bit tricky. Uh, the first thing, most of the investment, let's say, on the tracks, uh, we have in the, uh, in the sites, building the antennas, building the BTSs, for the coverage. If we are now going for the next generation and we are able to apply for the same spectrum, this means with a new radio technology we can keep the sites, we can keep the same distance, we even have better coverage, uh, less smaller handover zones because of more uh, advanced uh, radio communication technologies. This as a site is already a reuse of the investment and I would say this is a much bigger part than on the products. When I come to the products, we are introducing, for example, ETCS over GPIS. This means we are introducing packet core functionalities uh, in, in the core network. By definition, and also by enhancements of some of the products that we have on the market, they are already capable not only to support a 2G, they can support a 3G, a 4G, and even their evolution path for the 5G network. So the products and the functionality as such is ev evolving. The second thing is, or the third thing is, we are introducing heavily IP technology on the transmission um, to interconnect the various systems. Uh, we are not only saving transmission costs by this one, but we are getting rid of all these old TDM-based switching systems. So we are going more on IT platforms. Uh, the main uh, uh, investment is not on the hardware anymore, it's a software-driven investment. Software gets easier to enhance, gets easier to change, can run on different uh, uh, scalable uh, uh, platforms. Uh, other functionalities in the radio, BTSs we have today are not that uh, big racks anymore, they are small ones. So co-location of different systems or even multi-radio technologies in the BTSs uh, are available in today's technology. So there is a reuse factor for sure. Uh, we cannot expect this from the BTSs that we have deployed in 2000 or 2001, uh, but the latest one uh, offered now have uh, 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 migration possibilities. 
uh, IP interfaces, which we expect also to come in the future, like session information protocol interfaces on the dispatcher in the core network. Functionality is there, which is already also reused in modern technology beyond 2G. So, um, but as I said, the products as such, and all the civil works and the side costs uh, uh, for, the, for the spectrum, this is the most uh, uh, benefit that you have as a railway, uh, and, and the most savings are there if you can rely on the same range of spectrum and not have to go to a higher spectrum where you have to have build additional sites, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's the reason. Hello, Peter Willems, my name. Um, if I'm an owner of locomotives, I uh, recently bought with ETCS, uh, with a brand new GSMA system in it, Voice and EDOR. Um, I'm getting a little bit uh, yeah, concerned about the, the developments, because here already, already are mentioned uh, two major upgrades of these GSMA technology, one for Germany, and when you have a major change for baseline three, for example, you need to replace it with the latest uh, standard, and then if I look to the to the long term solution, end of 20, uh, I have another upgrade. That means in the locomotive lifetime of 30 years, I have to replace it three, four, maybe five times. Um, it would not be such a big issue if I could replace it like my cell phone. Yeah, that. Uh, last two or three years, and then I buy a new one and uh, download the copy on the cloud, and then I continue. Um, in ERTMS, GSMR is fully integrated in the system as such. It's, it's certified, it's part of the integration, it's part of the authorization. Can we smooth this migration by developing triple IVES specifications so that I can plug and play GSMR equipment without recertification of the whole locomotive and reauthorization. You have not indicated who you would like to um, address your question. Uh, just that, uh, <coughs> I think that's the industry. They specify, they do the elevation. Somebody must be able to answer it. Yes, I, I, I think the, the question is, is, is very valid, and uh, I think this is the reason why we are so keen in the cooperation with Shift to Rail. I think that we fully share uh, your, your concern that innovation is necessary and is good. We have heard how the other sectors are moving much faster. On the other way, we should not be hampered or, or create for ourselves unnecessary problems or costs due to the introduction of innovation. For example, for ATO, one of the clear lines we are following is to try to separate the safe from the non-safe software or applications, because we do not want that when ATO is integrated on the uh, locomotive, on the vehicles, then uh, also the safety part or the, 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 the authorization of the vehicle has to be put in question again. As Joseph was saying this morning, we will see how the vehicle authorization details on the implementing act will be voted uh, tomorrow, I think, at the risk. So there is still some detailed work to be done, but clearly this is the intention that we have working together with the NSA, to protect as much as possible the responsibility of each actor and making sure that the system remains as safe as it is, but not trying to do an overkill and every time that we have a minor modification having to run the complete process of reauthorization of the associated cost. So uh, this is not a complete answer to, to your question, but I wanted only to share the fact that we are fully convinced that uh, we want a better railway system, but we want a railway system. We have to make sure that we don't kill it with additional costs um, and, and uh, red tape when it's not necessary. Pio, may, may I it, give a comment? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I think with the... Uh, uh, introduction that we have now in also in the standards which we started a couple of years ago to, to bringing ETCS running on a, ET, uh, on a GPIS on a packet switch technology in the network 
is already a tremendous step to get into a solution which at the end only requires a normal IP layer uh, underneath ETCS. So this is from the, uh, uh, from the standardization and also from the realization point of view, not only for saving capacity in today's GSM networks, because we are reducing the requested time slots on the, in the uh, air interface, but we have already a, a, a decoupled uh, uh, approach where ETCS can run on any IP layer. So there's not a lot to do on top on, on realization and spe uh, uh, specification on, on this one. Yeah, so so we, we uh, get information from countries uh, uh, outside Europe. They are trying to to map already ETCS to run on a on a 4G layer. Yeah, because the, the main step is already done by by going into these uh, 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 packet switch technology and adapting the the ETCS layer accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Robert, I've already given the floor to you before. I'm uh, mindful of the time. And I would like to give uh, the final remarks uh, for, for this session. I think that we are now uh, going to the cocktail part, where I'm sure that you will have enough time to uh, have detailed discussions with all the panelists that we have seen today. I would like to ask you to give a round of applause to all the speakers that we have had in this afternoon.